Great, thank you. Um, just because Gustav mentioned disciplines, I will point out that this paper is um, an all too rare, extremely interdisciplinary uh, collaboration between three philosophers and me, a sociologist. And uh, in my experience, uh, working across disciplines is surprisingly hard and doesn't actually pay off all that often. But uh, I find at the Institute, almost exceptionally, it does actually work. And so I'm very pleased to have been involved in a paper that really uh, does bring together these two disciplines. Um, I think everybody here will be uh, fairly aware, but extremely quickly, I will just say that this is part of the Climate Ethics and Future Generation program uh, funded by RJ. Uh, and um, uh, I think people here are pretty familiar with that. But I sort of think, in a sense, this project is about you know, a question that uh, is phrased in the IPCC's 2014 report, which I've reproduced here, what duties do present generations owe future generations, given that our greenhouse gas emissions will affect their quality of life, number of life, and so on? There's other questions. Here are some of the questions that the program is investigating. How should we value future people? How can burdens and benefits associated with combating climate change be distributed fairly? Um, and what can we do to make decision making uh, in a democratic society sort of work better for this? Most of the project is normative in various ways, but I have a little bit of it and I'm an empirical social scientist. So these are the kinds of questions which I am tasked with answering as part of the, the program. Uh, what value do ordinary people actually attach to uh, future generations, their well-being? Um, for example, relative to themselves or other things they might value. And are people motivated by concerns in any sense about intergenerational justice? So we have a very nice kind of combination of, of normative uh, work with empirical social science addressing uh, these kinds of topics. So the, the paper that I'm presenting today, which as Gustav mentioned, uh, is, is co-authored uh, uh, across four of us, uh, kind of addresses two questions which you can see here. Uh, to what extent do lay people uh, value future generations, and in what's to what degree or to what extent is uh, our collective failure really to do anything adequate about climate change thus far due potentially to a lack of concern about the well-being of future generations? Uh, as you know, the impacts of our greenhouse gas emissions will, um, well, they are clearly already having uh, severe impacts on the earth with all the fires we're seeing and Western North America currently, for example. Uh, but the really heavy hit will, of course, come even later. And therefore, people who aren't even born yet or younger generations will pay the, the, the greatest price. <coughs> so arguably, uh, you could say, maybe we aren't doing anything about climate change because we're going to, those of us here, those of us alive today, are going to be gone before actually there's a, a bill to pay for our actions. And we just don't care that much about the people come after us. That, that could explain some of our behavior. Um, so these are the two questions which I'm going to uh, tackle in this paper. Uh, uh, and I'll just sort of go over a couple of little background bits of information that I think are relevant for contextualizing this sort of uh, this project. Um, I would just point out that aside from climate change, it's been known for a very long time, uh, I would say, that one of the classic reasons why we have any environmental problems at all is that, in general, they have impacts on people who aren't yet here to represent themselves. So this is not uh, a super new idea, but it's obviously kind of come to the fore more, more strongly in recent years. We don't actually have a great deal of research uh, to build on about how people value future generations. Um, uh, and how people even, to the degree to which people even think about those who come after them. Uh, it's an interesting question, I think, clearly, but we don't actually have a lot of social science on this. We do know from lots of research that people think about climate change as something that isn't so urgent because they feel it's this, tend to feel it's a kind of distant thing. Yeah, it will affect people, but not me. It will affect people over there, but not here. It will affect people in the future, but not now. Maybe that's changing as more people uh, experience concrete impacts uh, of climate change. But, but thus far, that seems to be pretty clearly the way people tend to think about it. We also have a little bit of existing research on um, the question of whether people, in a sense, care more about the environment, given its 
it's sort of delayed consequences and impacts if they themselves have, in a sense, a demographic relationship to the future, i.e. children of their own. Potentially, you could say, if you yourself don't have children, you don't care as much as someone who does. Uh, but this is kind of an open question. So I've cited one very recent paper here that looked uh, using panel data on individuals and compared people to themselves um, at a previous point in time after they've had children and also compared people simultaneously to those who didn't have children. And actually, they didn't really find that having children makes any particular difference to people's environmental attitudes or environmentally consequential behaviors. So the theory that demographically having a connection to the future matters, yeah, so far isn't, isn't particularly well supported. So as I said, we could think about humanity's failure to act on climate change and potentially other environmental problems as representing selfishness. We like our, you know, very carbon intensive holidays, big houses, flash cars, whatever, because we just don't care about future generations, potentially. So one way of thinking about this, this question is to say, well, it's all about your willingness to, to bear, to pay a price, to, to cover the cost of your lifestyle. Um, but there's another way of looking at it. Uh, and this is reflected in the fact that if you read the economic literature on the costs of mitigating climate change, um, they're surprisingly cheap. So we think of climate change as a huge phenomenon because it is, and clearly our, uh, our economies have a lot of impacts on the climate, but uh, the estimates I've seen of the economic cost of doing something about it are surprisingly small, which surprises people. But if we actually put in place the right policies to do this, it would kind of be in the noise over the long term of economic growth. But even aside from that, there's another way we could think about the costlessness to us, potentially, of dealing with climate change, which is scholars like John Broom, a uh, sort of economist philosopher, and Jeff Sachs, uh, an economist economist, say, well, we could even do something a little bit crazier and just literally give the, give the bill to people who are going to benefit if we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Let's just essentially do what needs to be done to serve their interests and just run up debt. We're going to give them some debt, but we'll also give them a really nice planet to live on. If they were here, future generations, to talk to us, they might say, eh, that's a fair deal, particularly because, again, referring to the economics literature, future people supposedly are going to be a lot richer than us. So if you extrapolate, you know, world economic standards of living, potentially, they're going to have the resources to pay that bill much more than we will, that we do. So therefore, you could say that failing to mitigate climate change is not a consequence of selfishness. It must be a consequence of something else because it, it, it wouldn't actually cost us anything to do it. So there's some other reason. Now, the second reason, then, that we explore in this paper is distrust. So imagine y you do care about future generations, uh, and someone comes to you and says, I have a way we can do something to help those people. You have to believe that that person's plan will actually work. You have to believe that that person isn't just telling you to donate a little bit of money now because they want to take your money and run away and use it for their own purposes, and it will never actually benefit the people they're saying it will benefit. Um, and so we could look at attitudes towards future-oriented policies as reflecting the level of confidence or trust you have in the functioning of society. Um, you might believe that policymakers, policy, public policy administrators, the people who design and implement things, um, maybe they're incompetent, maybe they're corrupt, maybe they're liars, in which case, you might care a lot about future people, but you still wouldn't support, for example, paying a carbon tax or whatever. And there is lots of research, I've done some of it myself, showing that um, political or institutional trust and to some extent social trust, your belief in the general trustworthiness of other people, um, 
is very closely tied to people's support for environmental policies. So the question we want to ask is, to what extent does people support for future-oriented policies with respect to climate change, but also potentially other things, a reflection of people's concerns about future generations, the value they attach to future generations, relative to their confidence in the mechanisms by which we could do something for future generations. I hope that distinction is, is fairly clear. So the way we investigate this is we commission short surveys in four countries, uh, Sweden, Spain, uh, South Korea, and China. And we pick these countries, we could have picked others, uh, because they span two very uh, distinct world regions, different cultures, um, clearly different levels of economic development, uh, particularly important for our purposes, different levels of institutional trust. So prior surveys generally show that most Chinese people, for example, have a pretty high level of trust in Chinese institutions. Um, uh, same thing in Sweden. Past surveys have shown, generally speaking, trust is quite a bit lower in Korea and Spain. So we had you know, different cultures, different levels of trust. We've also got different levels of climate policy performance. Sweden's a pretty high performer. Um, uh, Korea is actually a very poor performer when it comes to, to uh, to uh, climate policy in Spain and China, you know, there's lots of things you could debate about this, but sort of regarded as being a bit more in between. Um, and so we wanted to get a sort of mix of different countries and apply the same kinds of analysis in, in these four cases. So we get about a thousand people in each of these countries. Basically, we're looking at adults. I should note that in China, we get a rather different sort of sample. It's clearly not. Uh, I, w I wouldn't say these samples are represent perfectly representative in any of the countries, but in China, I think it's particularly uh, probably biased. It's a younger sample. It also um, is, is more urban and highly educated. But in general, we do get a diversity of people in all these countries, so I call them sort of representative-ish. These are web panels. So these are all people who are on the Internet. We know some of their background demographic characteristics. So we ask them a series of questions, how much people think about future generations, how much they care, what they would support in terms of population change in the future. So part of the bigger climate ethics project uh, is to investigate population ethics. And one of the things we'd like to know is how lay people think about the value of population per se. We ask the respondents how willing they would be to sacrifice for future generations how um, strongly they would support or oppose uh, a policy to sort of further the interests of future generations. And we randomly assign to them what that policy is. So some people get asked about a climate policy. Some people get asked about a policy to reduce national debt. So we wanted to see, would it make a difference uh, if, you t if you ask people about very different kinds of ways of doing something for future generations. And within each of these two domains, we ask, for example, how you'd feel about a, a, a new tax, like a carbon tax, or just some sort of generic tax increase to help pay down public debt, cutting spending, we don't say on what, but just generally speaking, cutting public spending, or on the climate side, funding technology. Um, so some people, in answering our little mini survey, literally never hear the word climate. It's only all about debt policies. But some people, they get climate, and they get climate all the way through. After this, they get a question about their confidence in how effective the policy would be. Um, finally, we get two questions about people's optimism about future changes in human living standards. I'll, I'll explain in a moment why we ask that. And then we have a series of four questions about people's trust in different major social institutions. So that's the sort of panorama of the questions. Let me just say that in addition to the global sort of research question I outlined earlier, asking these various things allowed us to investigate a variety of sort of more specific sub-questions, which I'll show you here. How does concern about the well-being of future generations differ across people with different demographic characteristics? Um, oh, what's oh, this has gone funky formatting. Okay, I'll have to read this. Sorry, something's gone strange. Um, we also wanted to find out how people um, uh, 
how people's views of these different policies differ. Uh, we wanted to find out about the relative importance of values and beliefs in determining policy attitudes. So I've just explained, we ask people how much they support a policy that would um, uh, help future generations. What we want to do is try to assess the relative importance of this concern, uh, the value side, or the belief side, the trust in social institutions, okay? Um, I think I can probably skip over the rest of this. Ah, but I should explain why we asked the question about optimism. So I have to admit, we didn't fully think this through before we asked the survey. We had some ideas why we wanted to ask the optimism question, but it turns out, and I've had this experience occasionally as a researcher, you do something that's actually more profound than you realize at the time. So we inadvertently hit on a really, really fascinating test of the theory that trust, or the, not the test, but the question, does trust matter more than concern? So ask yourself a question. Do you normally make charitable contributions to people who are richer than you? No. Generally speaking, we give charity to people who are poor. But imagine future generations really are richer than us. If I asked you now to make a voluntary charitable contribution to th the future, knowing that those people will be richer than us, how would you feel about that? You probably would be less willing to do it. So we might expect people with a more optimistic view of future living standards to be less willing to sacrifice for future generations because we don't donate to charities where the people are richer than us. On the other hand, we might also expect the opposite. We might expect people to be more willing to, d to sacrifice for future generations if your willingness to sacrifice and your expectation about future changes in living standards are both a consequence of a third factor. And that factor is basically trust. Do you have confidence that social institutions basically work? That public administrators aren't just all lying, corrupt, cheating people? Do you think we live in a world where the media basically tell the truth? Do, you w do we live in a world where if you buy something from a large corporation, it generally works? You know, there are people with very dark views of all of these kinds of institutions. And so you could, you could actually expect people to be more willing to pay money to make a sacrifice for future generations because you actually are more confident that the world is functional and will continue to get better. Thus the question about optimism. Um, uh, we're relying on self-reporting. People could be telling us things that they know themselves aren't true, or they could even be telling us things that um, they, they, they in the moment feel like is true, but isn't really true. So Tim made a big, very big deal out of this when we were discussing this paper. He thought it was very important we acknowledge this could be, this is just, this is just what people say. So we don't really know if they value future generations. We're going on whether they say they value future generations. We're also not quantifying things at all. We're just asking people on sort of very simple answer scales, how much do you care, not very much, and so on. And the samples we've got are definitely not sort of perfectly representative. So I'm not going to make a huge deal out of any cross-national differences in the average level of different things. We can look at it, and I think there are actually some reasons to think we did capture some cross-national differences, but I wouldn't be you know, I wouldn't make super, super strong claims about that. So here's the question about thinking. How often would you say you think about the lives of future people who have not even been born yet? Uh, caring, how would you say, how much would you say you, you care or do not care about the future quality of life who, of people who have not been born yet? Here's where we start to get into some of our experimental treatments where we've randomly assigned people to different versions of questions, okay? So each individual person, individual respondent, got only one version, one specific version, selected at random of this different question about people's attitudes towards increasing the population. And as you can see, what we did is we tried giving people statements effectively saying, think about it like this. You know, if a bigger future population were to mean a lower future standard of living, what would you say about it? If it were to mean um, people were still enjoying a high standard of living, what would you think about it? And what we, what we wanted to do with this was to try to figure out 
what is the relationship between people's expectations about the implications of population for standard of living and their support for increasing population per se? Here's our core question about people's willingness to sacrifice for the future. Would you be willing to reduce your standard of living so that people in the future can lead better lives? You could quibble with the language, standard of living, better lives, what does that mean? We're kind of using these terms all in a, in a fairly loose sense. Here's our policy support question. For example, the government could in place, put in place policies to reduce global warming. This could benefit people in the future, though it would have costs in the shorter term for people alive today. In other words, we're framing this as a cost. We're trying to get people to think about policies as a cost and then asking them how much they would support their, their governments doing that. And again, we gave people lots of different potential versions of this question to see what difference it makes, whether you refer to global warming or you refer, for example, to reducing national debt. Now, those of you who are very well versed in economics and, and sort of you know, the latest current thinking in macroeconomics and so on, maybe would say, well, debt is an overrated issue. You know, it depends what you do. If you, sometimes taking on debt is actually good for the future because you're investing. Granted, I'm not, I'm not denying any of that, but we just wanted to see, would we get different results if we referred to something completely different than, than global warming? In some cases, we could ask about the exact, pretty much the exact same policy, increasing taxes, increasing taxes. In other cases, we tried to sort of tr you know, use different sorts of um, specific policy actions. We asked people's confidence in whether these policies would effectively, would actually work if the government succeeded in reducing global warming. Are you confident this would improve the lives of future generations? And then various other ways of asking a similar sort of question. Not succeeded in reducing global warming, but if the government said it was introducing new policies to reduce global warming, do you think it would actually work? And so on. Um, so there's a bit of a parallel between the policy question and the confidence question. If, like I said before, if somebody got randomly assigned to a question about global warming, then they got a global warming confidence question as well. If they got assigned to the national debt track, then they stayed on the national debt track for this question. But within the tracks, um, whatever question you got on the global warming side, you were then randomly assigned to one of these. And on the national debt side, you were then as randomly assigned to one of these. So we can see what difference, for example, it makes to people's confidence in policies if the first question they got referred to tax. Standard of living. What do you think future standards of living will be? Will they get lower than now? A lot lower, a lot higher, etc. And then um, we ask people's trust on a scale from 0 to 10 in university research centers, the news media, business and industry, and or the national parliament or congress. So a mix of, mix of different kinds of institutions. Um, OK, that's the setup. Just before I go into the results, any questions to clarify anything thus far? People satisfied with that? OK. So here's what we found. Um, I'll go through five steps in our results, as you can see here. Uh, the first thing, concern for future generations. Here's the average answer we got about the two questions about thinking about future people and caring about future people in each of the, the four countries. As you can see, China is sort of notably distinct from the other, uh, the other countries. I think from for a variety of reasons, that partly reflects the, the sample we got, which, as I said before, is rather different demographically than, I think, the general Chinese population. But there are al also cross-national surveys of Chinese people on various other things. I don't think this is entirely due to the fact that we've got a, a biased sample. I think it is actually the case that people in China, and you will see why, might be expressing um, some of these kinds of feelings. But the main thing is we can see I don't really have a great sort of dramatic, yes, people care, no, people don't care. It's in the sort of messy middle, right? Well, most people actually, if we just sort of take percentages, a majority of people basically say somewhere on the upper half of the spectrum of answers for these things. For the most part, people sort of imply, yeah, I care, not too much. I don't think about them that much, but if I do, I kind of care. Um, so we can start to look at predictors of being more concerned for future generations. Question. Yes. 
the the original question? Yes. What was Fergus three mean? Uh, I'd have to go back. Let's see. I mean, it's just it's just you know, it's just to try to get a sense of. They've been rescaled. To yes. Market. They've been they've been rescaled to a zero to ten because the next question was on a zero to ten scale. Sorry. So to make them comparable, I've just rescaled them to zero to ten. You know, I mean, you could look at this and say, well, that's not that. You know, people aren't that concerned. But on the other end, you could also look at it and sort of say, yeah, but it's nowhere near zero. So I don't know. It's a bit hard to characterize. What I can tell you is that in every one of the four countries, I found this uh, fascinating, older people were less concerned about future generations. So the coefficient on age is negative and statistically significant. It's not a huge relationship. The slope isn't massive. But it was pretty consi it was totally consistent across countries as was the correlation with having uh, a child in the household. So the way Ipsos asks the question doesn't say, are you a parent? It says, is there a child in your household or something to that effect? And again, across all four countries, if you live in a household with at least one child, apparently you care more about the future. So this is sort of contradicting the, the Milfont study, which I, which I cited earlier that came out earlier this year. Um, I don't know how to reconcile that. But I found it fascinating that we got identical results in all four countries, and it seems like the sort of demographic theory of having a connection to the future is, is supported. Okay, what about willing, uh, willing to pay for future well-being to sacrifice or to support future-oriented policies with a cost? So the top bar for each country is the average answer to the question about being willing uh, to reduce your standard of living so that people in the future can lead better lives. And then the next three bars are the global warming policy questions, and then the next three bars are the public debt questions. And what you can see is that um, Chinese people, again, kind of stand out. The other three countries aren't so distinct from each other. Again, support is kind of like, well, you know, depending on which country you look at, depending on which particular policy, it's sort of in the messy middle. People are not extremely hostile to any of these policies. They're not extremely supportive of any of these policies. Um, we can see quite consistently that tax isn't so popular as anything else. People don't like to pay taxes, even in Sweden, apparently. Um, people don't like the idea of uh, cutting public spending in order to reduce public debt. Uh, technology seems a bit more neutral. Um, so again, I can't give you a, a super clear, people hate this stuff, people love this stuff. It's, it's, kind, of in the, it's kind of in the messy middle. Um, it wasn't the case that for these outcome variables, uh, demographic predictors were as consistently uh, related as they were for the concern questions. So we didn't find that age and, and having children in the household were particularly good predictors of people's answers to these questions. Um, children, it's, it's, it's a bit indicative. I wouldn't say it's quite totally consistent. It's not a totally sort of clear-cut result. It's kind of there. Um, uh, as I said before, people were more supportive of policies uh, uh, that didn't involve taxes. Oh, and I didn't mention, overall, people were a little bit more enthusiastic, the people in our sample at least, about policies for reducing global warming than they were about policies for reducing national debt. Maybe because the kind of people who are in online panel surveys tend to be uh, you know, a little bit more kind of left-wing, but not sure. Okay, so here we start to get into the analytically uh, a kind of more provocative thing, which is trying to weight the impact of concern or values against trust or people's beliefs about how the world works and how institutions function. So what we did is we uh, standardized our two-item uh, concern index and our four-item uh, trust index so that we can directly compare the size of the coefficients on these two things. Um, and what we see is that pretty much, I think in every case, wasn't, no, there was, no. So there's no exception. <laughs> um, trust wins 
Trust is the stronger predictor. And that's true whether we, we just run a, a regression model with those two variables alone, or if we throw in a whole bunch of control variables like demographics or which particular policy we're talking about or whatever. Um, so it seems like if we all we do is we take people's answers to the question about supporting these different policies, that trust is actually the strongest predictor of whether you support it or not. Um, do you trust these, these major institutions? So here you can sort of see also some of the other results I talked about before. If it's a tax that we ask, ask people about, the coefficient is negative, support is lower. Um, if it has to do with global warming, with the exception of Sweden, where it's not statistically significant, there's a strong difference that people prefer policies related to global warming rather than reducing debt. Having a child in the household, except in China, there's no relationship. Income isn't much of a story, education, gender. So that's kind of where we, we find the weight of our ability to predict people's attitudes towards doing something for the future is. Um, if we ask about confidence, remember I said we have a question about confidence that these policies will work. Most people seem to be reasonably confident that the policies will work. Again, it's kind of messy in the middle. Um, but what we do know is that confidence is very strongly related to whether you support the policy. So if you're confident it will work, it seems pretty clear you're going to support it. If you don't support the policy, it's probably because you're saying you're, you're not confident it will work. Confidence about whether the policies will work is also fairly strongly related to institutional trust. So do you think things in society actually work as they say they're going to work? Um, that said, without getting into the details of why, we have a little survey experiment in here which demonstrates, depending on which country you look at, that to some degree your confidence in whether something will work is um, not just a cause of whether you support it, but a consequence. So if I ask you a question about tax first, and then I ask you how confident you are some policy will work, even if it's not a tax policy, your confidence in some countries is a little bit lower. In other words, people are so spooked by the idea of paying a new tax that they actually grow less confident in other things. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I like to walk around, I'm sorry. OK. Um, Right. Population, for the population ethicists in the room. Um, we asked people not just about, I, had to, I have to explain this. We actually had a very complicated survey experiment, which I'm not going to get into, where we gave people reminders about the implications of their choices. Don't worry too much about that. That ended up having sort of small, not particularly surprising effects. I'm not going to get into it. The main thing you need to know is that if... Um, if we uh, told people that there would be no change in living standards if we increased population, that um, slightly uh, raised people's support for higher population. In other words, I think what that shows is by default, people think that if you raise living standards, sorry, if you increase the population, you will lower people's living standards. So people have an idea that there's a trade-off between quality and quantity of life. Now, you may say that's wrong, you may say that's right, but that's what ordinary people, to some degree, believe. So if you tell people, look, 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 it's okay, it's not going to hurt their living standards, then how would you feel about an increase in population? They get a bit more supportive. Um, we didn't find any consistent demographic predictors of attitudes towards increasing the population. We tried, again, fitting models uh, where the two predictors were our index of concern and our index of institutional trust. And just the same as for policy actions, these were both pretty strong predictors. So whether you care and whether you believe things work, whether you uh, trust in institutions, both predict you um, having more enthusiasm about the idea of a bigger future population. Okay, and my final, fifth and final sort of section of the results um, is, uh, is this question about how optimistic you are about future standards of living. Do you think they're going to go up? Do you think they'll go up a lot? Do you think they'll go down? So drum roll, people who expect future standards, future standards of living to go up are more willing to sacrifice for future generations. 
Um, they're more supportive of any policy you ask them about. They're more supportive of increasing the population. And as we'd expect, they're more trusting and they're more confident that policies will actually work. So this was the thing that we didn't fully foresee and we ran the analysis and it was like, wow, that's really fascinating. People who expect the future to be richer are more willing to make charitable contributions to the future. At first I couldn't explain it. I thought, that doesn't make sense. We don't give voluntary charitable contributions to people who are richer than us. But of course, if you believe the world is functional, you believe that a sacrifice you make will be meaningful, that it won't just disappear into the pockets of corrupt bureaucrats or whatever, of course, you're more willing to do it. So, uh, our conclusions. Um, we think people's answers to the concern questions do suggest that they care about future generations. Um, we think that uh, we can interpret these questions, uh, the responses to these questions to suggest that at least people are willing to say in a survey um, whether they're lying to the, to the survey surveyors or to the even to themselves, they are in many cases willing even to sacrifice for future generations. Um, concerns about the future do seem to shape people's attitudes towards future-oriented policies. There is a strong relationship, but the relationship is even stronger for people's trust in major social institutions and the confidence they have that those institutions will implement policies in a way that will actually yield real benefits. And so returning to the John Broom suggestion, should we just throw the debt onto future generations for you know, giving them a nice planet? Well, my objection to that argument is that even if we decided to try to do that, even if policymakers could be convinced to take up that proposal, if policymakers went to the public and said, guess what, we have a great plan, we're gonna transform our economy, and we're just basically going to run up a big bill in doing it, and we're going to give the bill to future generations. It's not clear to me that the public would actually believe it. They might not support that policy, that choice of action, because they simply don't have enough confidence in the institutions that would be tasked with carrying it out. And in a certain sense, I can understand that, right? I mean, somebody says, I'm going to do this great thing. You need to give me a little bit of money now, and it's going to do this wonderful thing for the world. You know, people are skeptical. And actually, I don't think all of that is unreasonable. On the other hand, we also know, one of my mantras, is that environmental policies work great when we do them. We just don't do them enough. So if we want to try to convince the public to do more things for the climate, and actually I would add for other sort of environmental problems, personally I think the biggest challenge we face is not convincing people about the problem. It's convincing people about the solutions. So let me just close with a couple questions which maybe could trigger a little bit of discussion. Um, just to, to maybe overstate the case slightly, um, do we confront um, growing divides in societies, maybe more severe in some societies than others, where there are people who live in a world that is functional, where basically institutions do what they say and do what they're told, where public figures and people you see on TV mostly tell the truth, don't steal money whenever they can, etc. Or we, do we live in a world where people you see on TV are constantly finding tax loopholes, constantly finding ways to get government contracts in, you know, shady, through shady means, um, where institutions are incompetent, tax money is wasted, international institutions, are anti-democratic. You know, I could go on, right? I think this kind of, for me, touches a bit of a bigger sociological issue, which is, which is this question of growing sort of social divides with respect to these questions. Um, but potentially that has big implications for climate policy, is what I kind of took away from this. Now, I'm pretty much finished present, uh, presenting the paper, but in just a, an additional couple of minutes, I have a surprise, <laughs> including for my co-authors. They didn't know about this. Literally only a couple of weeks ago, through just a random connection, I happened to notice the 2010 Eurobarometer, 
asked some very interesting questions across Europe. And here was sort of one of the little, you know, obscure news items summarizing the results. 71% of those surveyed agreed that reforms which benefit future generations should be pursued, even if it means sacrifices for the present generation. But just 46% say they are personally willing to reduce their living standards in order to guarantee the future of next generations. Now, I googled all different combinations of these words. Nobody has published anything. You know, this just disappeared into the ether. I don't know if people know what the Eurobarometer is. Basically, the European Union pays for these big surveys. I don't know exactly what they're trying to do with some of this information sometimes. It just goes poof and nobody ever hears from it again. But in this case, although it's 10 years ago, I think this was absolutely fascinating. So I did a little analysis because you can download the data. And here's what I found. Um, oh, sorry, I should specify. These are, the, these are the exact question wordings they used for tens of thousands of people across Europe. Reforms that benefit future generations should be pursued, even if that means some sacrifices for the present generation. Um, are you willing to reduce your living standards now for future generations? And they have an optimism question. I loved this. It's not the best optimism question. It's the optimism you have about the future of the European <laughs> Union. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, beggars can't be choosers. Um, but one nice thing is they also have a lot of questions about trust in institutions and a question about where people see themselves sitting on uh, the left-right political spectrum. And what I found is that based on these data, Europeans with more trust in institutions are substantially more willing to sacrifice for future generations, whichever of these two questions you look at, as are people who are more optimistic about the future of the EU. Totally consistent with what we found. Um, political ideology wasn't particularly strongly related, insofar as it's related actually people on the right uh, appeared to be slightly more willing to, to pay a price for future generations, which I thought was interesting. Um, and in this data set, inconsistent with our results, older Europeans say they're more willing to sacrifice, perhaps because they have slightly higher levels of institutional trust. So it's just averaging across, you know, like 30 countries. Um, but consistent with our results, if you have a child in the house, um, you're slightly more willing to support these sorts of future-oriented actions. So I thought that was super interesting. Um, kind of makes me a little bit more confident in our results as well, most of our results. And I'll just leave you with a slide from another survey, um, which is, again, partly why I think that the, the China results we got are not completely based on our sample, based on a totally different survey, a question about, is the world getting better? What percentage of people in all these different countries say it's getting better? you know, the Chinese are off the scale. Maybe that just reflects the fact that, you know, things in China in the last generation have been a pretty good news story. They're happy with how their society has changed and maybe they just think it's gonna keep going in the same way. What's fascinating is how negative and pessimistic people are in other countries. <laughs> Even in Sweden, only 10% of people think the world is getting better. So I'll leave that there and uh, look forward to some question and answer.